Aloha students. Welcome to the lecture on chapter two. In chapter two, we're going to be talking about uh, some concepts regarding costing and specifically we'll look into a method of costing called job costing. Okay, so costs are, as we all know, um, the giving up or using up of resources, uh, generally cash normally, okay? but um, it's the using up of financial resources. In this book, we're going to be, or in this uh, course, we're kind of focused a little bit on manufacturing. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, different kinds of manufacturing companies primarily. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so manufacturing costs are comprised of three different costs. Those are direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead costs. These are also known as product costs because these are the costs that go directly into a product or that are associated with making a product. Non-manufacturing costs, also known as period costs, are those costs that are incurred either after the product is complete, so like selling costs, or they're company-wide administrative kinds of costs, sometimes called administrative overhead costs. For example, the accounting department, they're not involved with the making of a product. They keep track of the costs or the president's salary. The president is not directly um, related or directly in the process of making the product. Okay, so those are sometimes called back office or home office costs. Okay, and there's two Costs can be divided into two different types of costs, fixed cost and variable cost. Fixed costs are those costs that do not change with changes in volume or quantities. So these costs remain constant, remain the same all the time. Variable costs, on the other hand, go up or go down in proportion to changes in activities. So if you double the quantity, you double the cost, variable cost. Okay, and all costs pretty much can be divided into these two components. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so for manufacturing costs, I mentioned that there's three different kinds of costs, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. So direct materials are those materials that go directly into the product. Okay, so when they're manufacturing a product, these are things that can be traced directly to the product. For example, athletic socks, the cotton that's made, that's used to make athletic socks that goes directly into the product. Therefore, that's a direct material. Direct labor are labor costs for employees who directly work on the product. Okay, so assembly line workers at a automobile plant, for example, they work directly on the product itself, therefore they're direct labor. Contrast that with the supervisor who's part of the manufacturing process but doesn't work directly with the product, that's not direct labor. Okay, that's manufacturing overhead because manufacturing overhead costs are all the costs that are related to manufacturing a product that are not direct materials and direct labor. Okay. Manufacturing overhead may also include costs that are not easily traceable to a product or it's just too much trouble to try to figure out the cost that goes into the product. And an example of that might be going back to the athletic socks. Uh, this is debatable, but perhaps the thread used to uh, sew the, let's say the top of the socks, okay. because that's such a minor non-material amount, maybe it's not worth the effort to try to trace those costs to the cost of the thread. 
you might be only a penny's worth of thread used in an athletic sock. So that's not worth keeping track of. So we won't keep track of it directly as direct materials, but we'll just call it manufacturing overhead. And in subsequent chapters, we'll see how we charge or allocate these manufacturing overhead costs to the product, okay? So again, it's either not direct materials or it's too small <clears throat> to try to trace to the individual product. So we just put it into manufacturing overhead. Okay, so costs include indirect materials, indirect labor, stuff like depreciation on the machinery, maintenance on the production machinery, utilities, electricity on the factory, etc. So any costs associated with making the product, but it's not direct materials or direct labor, those are manufacturing overhead costs. This concept of product versus period costs. Product costs are those costs that are incurred in making the product. And again, those three costs are direct materials, direct, oops, sorry, excuse me, direct labor and manufacturing overhead. Okay, so the costs that go into the product are product costs. Period costs are selling costs and administrative costs. So these are costs incurred by the company as a whole that are not part of the making of the product, okay? The reason we split it out this way is product costs, we keep track of the cost by product. So I don't know how much is the cost of making a particular product. So we trace the costs in that product. For period cost, we keep track of those by periods, usually per month. For example, executive salaries. We keep track of that by month. How much do we spend on executive salaries per month? How much do we spend on legal fees per month? Okay, so we keep track of those kind of costs for a period of time. Product costs, we keep track of those per product because we want to know how much products cost. Okay, so for in manufacturing, there's three classifications of inventories. There's raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Raw materials are inventory, so these are materials on hand that have not yet been used in the manufacturing process. Okay, so they're sitting in a warehouse someplace. In our previous example of the socks, this is the raw cotton that is uh, not yet been processed. Okay, so raw materials again are materials that have not yet been placed into production, but will be in the future. Let's skip to the last one, finished goods inventory. These are the inventory or stuff that you have on hand that you've completed and that are ready to be sold. That's finished goods. In between, we have work in process. These are products that have had the process started, but are not yet completed. Okay. So at the end of the month, if you're still working on some products, that's work in process inventory. Okay, so again, raw materials are materials that have not yet been introduced into the manufacturing process. Work in process are goods that are still being worked on. Finished goods are products that are complete and ready for sale. And we'll see um, all of these classifications in a subsequent chapter. Okay, and here's uh, the details again of raw materials inventory, work in process inventory, and finished goods inventory. So the uh, connection between the different types of inventory and our manufacturing costs. Remember again, there's three manufacturing costs, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. Those go into work in process. So again, these are things that are being worked on that becomes finished goods. 
Again, finished goods are ready to be sold. And then when they're sold, it goes into cost of goods sold. And we'll look at this account in a little while. I think this uh, diagram would have been more complete if they had the raw materials inventory in there with an arrow pointing toward direct materials because raw materials inventory become direct materials during the manufacturing process. So they skipped that step. That, that would have been good to have a box for raw materials that lead with an arrow into direct materials. <clears throat> okay, and you see there for the manufacturing company, there, there are those three different types of inventories, raw materials inventory, work in process inventory, finished goods inventory. In uh, MBA 510, financial accounting, uh, you learn for a merchandiser, a company that sells merchandise, there was one inventory classification called merchandise inventory, and that was the stuff that was ready to be sold, but have not yet been sold. Manufacturer, there are those three different categories of inventory. Okay, the concept of cost of goods manufactured. <clears throat> So cost of goods manufactured basically is how much did we spend this month to manufacture products? Okay, and there's a specific formula for that. And we have homework assignments to help us understand that. So we take our manufacturing costs for the period. Again, those are the three manufacturing costs, direct materials, direct labor, and then manufacturing overhead. Those three together equal the cost to manufacture. Okay. But you already had some <clears throat> stuff that you were working on in the beginning of the period. So you have to add that cost and you subtract the cost of the inventory that you have at the end that you're still working on because that's not complete yet. So you have to subtract that out. The beginning work in process is stuff that you are finishing this, this uh, period. So you have to add that back in. Okay, so again, cost to manufacture plus your beginning work in process inventory minus your ending work in process inventory gives us cost of goods manufactured. Okay, and again, we have homework assignments to help us with that understanding as well. Okay, now we, that we have our cost of goods manufactured, we can compute cost of goods sold. Okay, cost of goods sold is if the, the um, inventory that you sold to customers, what did it cost us to, in this case, what did it cost us to make? And the derivation of that is you take your beginning finished goods inventory, add the cost of goods manufactured, which you just saw in the previous slide. Those two together equals cost of goods available for sale. That's everything that you could possibly sell if you sold everything you have. What you had in the beginning plus what you made this period. Okay, that's the cost for everything. But we have ending finished goods inventory. That's finished goods that we haven't sold yet. So we have to take that out in order to figure out what was the cost of the goods that we did sell. Okay, so cost of goods sold again, finish, beginning finished goods inventory plus cost of goods manufactured equals cost of goods available for sale. Subtract out the ending finished goods inventory that gives us cost of goods sold. And in the income statement, you can see how cost of goods sold fits in. Sales minus the cost of goods sold that we computed in the earlier slide. <clears throat> that gives us something called gross margin. You can think of gross margin as how much did we make from buying or making a product and then selling it? Okay, that's the sometimes called profit margin okay, or gross margin. From that, you have to take out all of your operating expenses, such as your selling expenses, administrative expenses, to get operating income. Okay. Okay, now, there's a couple of ways that we 
keep track of the cost in a production process. One is one way is called the process costing method. The other is called job cost method. In the job cost method, we keep track of costs when we're producing products that can or services even that can be categorized by specific jobs or customers, or if there's some way of dividing up what we do into separate jobs or separate orders. Okay. So an example are custom made stuff. We can keep track of the cost that goes into each separate custom made project or job. On the other hand, process costing, that method of keeping track of the cost is used for production of small, identical, low-cost items, mass-produced. So if you're doing something over and over and over again, and you cannot divide up what you do into separate projects or jobs, we use process costing. So as you can see, for like making paper, manufacturing paint. Yeah, you can't sp split that up into separate projects or separate jobs. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. In that case, we use process costing. Okay, and in this chapter, we're gonna be looking at job costing. Subsequent chapters, we'll look at process costing. Okay, so job costing. Again, here you see here are three manufacturing costs, direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Here's the job. So this is whatever we want to keep track of as far as costs. So direct materials, we can trace those directly to the job. So we know how much materials are being used for that particular job. Direct labor, likewise, we can trace how much labor goes into that particular job. So we can trace those costs directly into the job. The third cost, manufacturing overhead, however, is an overall kind of a thing. It's not specifically for one job like direct materials, direct labor is. So we have to spread that out among all the jobs that we have using some kind of basis. And we're gonna be learning a lot about how to allocate or spread out manufacturing overhead in, again, subsequent chapters. This chapter is mainly just um, giving you a broad overview of a lot of the concepts that we'll get into in more detail in later chapters. Okay, um, I don't know if they're gonna, probably not, but <clears throat> why do we want to know how much the cost is on a job? How much cost did we incur for this particular job? Why is it so important to know what the costs are? Well, as is pretty evident, we want to know what the cost is so that we know how much to charge the customer for the job. Okay, we obviously want to charge more to the customer than it cost us to do the job. So that's why we need accurate information about the cost of each job and what goes into that particular job, all the costs, because we want to charge all the cost, at least all the cost to the customer plus a profit margin on top of that. Okay, so that's why, and in this <coughs> first part of the, <coughs> excuse me, first part of the course, we'll learn a lot about how to do various methods of costing things. How do we track costs that go into particular products, jobs, projects, etc.? Don't worry so much about um, the details of, these are T accounts. Uh, this is more accounting specific than I really wanna get into in this course. Um, so don't worry so much about this. Just be aware that direct labor, later we'll see direct materials here, overhead all go into work in process. 
And when work in process is done, that gets transferred to finished goods. And then when the goods are sold, that goes into cost of goods sold. So again, don't worry about this accounting technical stuff for purposes of this class. Okay, so overhead. <clears throat> I said earlier that direct materials, direct labor, those are easy to trace to particular jobs because they're specifically only for that particular job or product or project. Overhead though, we have to charge the job for some overhead because somebody's got to have to pay for the overhead and we want to charge the customer for that. So we have to put those overhead costs into the project. The way we do that is we estimate ahead of time how much to charge the customer or charge the job for overhead. Okay. And the word predetermine implies that we're doing that ahead of time. So we're coming up with some kind of estimate about how much overhead we're going to charge to each project. That overhead, as we'll see, is going to be based on some kind of basis. Okay. An example would be, oh, for each hour of direct labor that we incur on a job, we'll charge an extra 150% of that to cover overhead. Okay, that's an example of a predetermined overhead rate. It's done ahead of time so that we know when we charge the customer approximately how much overhead to charge. And we have to es <coughs> estimate that <coughs> because we do that at the beginning of the year. We can't wait to the end of the year to figure out what the exact amount of overhead should have been charged to customers because it's too late by then. We need to charge them right away as soon as the job's done. So we have to estimate that using this predetermined overhead rate. So here's a quick example of a uh, <clears throat> predetermined overhead rate. You basically take the total overhead for the period. So this is a dollar amount up here. How much money are we going to spend on overhead for the year that we have to charge to customers? The denominator is the estimated total activity. And the total activity is depending on the cost driver. The cost driver is how are we going to spread out this total overhead to all the jobs? Examples might be for each unit produced. Another might be we spread it out based on how many direct labor hours the project or job used. Machine hours is a possibility. So there's all kinds of ways to spread out this overhead cost. And it's up to the company essentially to pick the basis that best um, gives the best estimate of how much overhead the job should cost. Obviously, a job or a business that has very high uh, labor, so it's a labor intensive kind of work, labor hours might be a good way to spread out this overhead. On the other hand, a business that uses a lot of machinery and not as much labor, maybe machine hours might be a good way to spread out the overhead. Okay, so that's the cost driver. Cost driver is the way that we spread out this total overhead. Okay, so <clears throat> as we said, the <clears throat> um, and they use POHR as the uh, abbreviation for predetermined overhead rate. Okay, so this predetermined overhead rate, it's predetermined. It's done at the beginning of the year, so it's based on estimates. Best based on the estimated dollar amount of overhead for the year and estimated activity for that cost driver for the year. So these are both estimates. We don't know for sure. <clears throat> so we base this predetermined overhead rate based on those estimates. At the end of the year, we compare <clears throat> those estimates <clears throat> to the actual results. And there's going to be either 
under or over applied overhead. That means because you're charging the job and consequently charging the customer based on these estimates, you may overcharge them or undercharge them depending on how off your estimate was. It's going to be practically impossible for your predetermined overhead rate to be exactly what the actual results turn out to be. There's going to be some difference. So you're either going to overcharge or undercharge the customer because your estimate of overhead might be slightly off. That's the concept of underapplied or overapplied. If you overcharge the customer because your estimates were too high, you'll have overapplied overhead. If you didn't charge enough <clears throat> to the customer because you were, your estimate was short of what it actually turns out to be, you wouldn't have charged enough. It's underapplied overhead. Now, you don't go back if you undercharge the customer for a job, let's say, in February. You can't go back at the end of the year and say, hey, you know what? We didn't charge you enough back in February, so we have to make up the difference now. You can't do that. So basically what you do is they underapplied overhead. You make an adjustment to cost of goods sold, which means you'll reduce the profits that you have. So you're eating that undercharge overhead to the client. On the other hand, if you charge too much overhead to the job because your estimates were um, over estimated compared to the actual, then you increase, <clears throat> so you reduce the cost of goods sold, which increases your profit. So in other words, you add all those overcharges to your profits. Because again, at the end of the year, you can't go back to the customer and say, oh, you know what? Back in February, we overcharged you for overhead, so we're going to give you back a refund for that. I mean, I guess you could, but uh, that's not normally done. You just basically absorb the overage into your profits. Okay. So again, under overapplied overhead goes as an adjustment to cost of goods sold, which results in increase or decrease in net income at the end of the year. Okay. So here's an example. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this company budgeted overhead at $200,000. So they thought the overhead was going to be, manufacturing overhead was going to be $200,000 for the year. And they're using uh, <clears throat> direct labor hours as their cost driver. Again, cost driver is the way that they're going to allocate the overhead. On what basis they're using direct labor hours. So they estimate 25,000 direct labor hours for their, all of their jobs for the year. So the predetermined overhead rate would be the $200,000 estimated overhead divided by the $25,000 estimated direct labor hours. So the predetermined overhead rate is $8 per hour. So what that means is for every hour of direct labor that they use on a job, they're going to charge an additional $8 to cover overhead. Okay, now let's say <clears throat> that this company actually had 24,000 direct labor hours for the year not the 25. They only had 24 direct labor hours. Now, they charged $8 an hour here. That's the predetermined overhead rate. And every time they had a job, that's the amount that they would be charging. So if they actually used 24,000 direct labor hours, they charged $8 for each of those hours. The amount of overhead that they would have charged to jobs would have been $192,000. So they would be short by uh, $8,000. Yep, they estimated $200,000. Uh, the, what they charged was one hundred and ninety-two. dollars okay? Well, actually, so if let, let's, let's take it a step further. If they ac had actual manufacturing overhead costs, so remember the $200,000 was an estimate. If they actually had $180,000, dollars worth of overhead cost, 
they would have charged 192 to the jobs to customers to cover all of their costs they should have charged 180 because that's what it actually turned out to be but they collected 192 so they over applied their overhead by twelve thousand dollars yeah so in other words they charged 192 to jobs the actual turned out to be 180 they overcharged by twelve thousand dollars so because they over applied cost of goods sold is too high so they will necessarily need to decrease cost of goods sold which in turn increases their net income so essentially what happens is that 12,000 overcharging they just add that to their net income it gets absorbed as income okay okay so again that's an example of over or under applied overhead you compare what they actually worked so the hours actually worked times your predetermined overhead rate that's what they actually charged compare that to the what turns out to be the actual manufacturing overhead costs in this case 180 they charged 192 they incurred 180 so they charged 12,000 too much that's over applied overhead here's a table that kind of uh, summarizes <clears throat> what you do with over or under applied overhead Okay, as far as the journal entries, uh, for purposes of MBA 610, we're not going to worry about journal entries. Um, that's for a accounting class and not necessarily for you folks. So don't worry about the journal entries. So if I can pretty much say for any of the chapters, if there are journal entries presented, don't worry about journal entries. Okay, we're not going to really get into that in this course. So skipping all these journal entries and that's the end of chapter two. Um, oh yeah, by the way, my favorite spectator sport, I love baseball. Okay, that's the uh, lecture on chapter three. So until next time, aloha.